saw God made some laws in creation, which were actually like boundaries. You know, this is, uh, you know, example, male and female, right? He said, these are the boundaries. If you're male, you're female. Uh, the different kinds, you know, he said, hey, you're going to repopulate the earth, uh, but, you know, you can only do that, you know, within your kind, you know. And angels and angels and, and men, mankind weren't one of those. <laughs> anyway, that's a bad joke. So, uh, you know, if you're a cow, you know, you're going to have cows. If you're a dog, you're going to have dog. You know what I mean? This is a kind. Humans are going to have, have humans. That's a limitation or a boundary. And we talked about how man naturally wants to fight against those boundaries, mix it up and say, no, 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 I think we can push that a little bit. Well, we're going to continue the story now here. That's why I had uh, Brother Justin read chapter 2, because now we're going to talk about God's commandments after the fall. And, of course, that is where the series is going to continue, because there's laws all throughout the Bible. There's a lot of boundaries that we see in the Bible. I want to talk about those a little bit in terms of uh, the kind of boundaries that we have in this, in, in this life and why we need them and, and what have you. So we notice that there are some uh, boundaries or rules, I should say, regulations that were put on people that are extremely, uh, you know, strict on those boundaries. There's, uh, you know, huge consequence to, to breaking those rules. And uh, an example of that would be when I had kids. Uh, I have, still have kids. But when my kids that are, <laughs> my older kids were younger, uh, I remember certain events in my mind. The preacher's kids always get used for illustrations, so just bear with me. But I remember uh, some specific examples in my mind of, of like training sessions and different rules that we had. And uh, really, I think, think about these boundaries. And in the rest of the message, we'll talk about how God has different boundaries on us. And really, if you think about these, these kind of, this, it's kind of a similar idea. So I don't want my children to hurt themselves. So we would have restrictions. You know, I want my kids to know, for instance, one of the big things when you have kids in the house and you want to uh, child-proof your house, what are you doing? You're covering up those electrical outlets. Because if they play with that electrical outlet, they could kill themselves. And so we would do uh, the little caps we put in there. That's one thing. But not only that, if the kid was going, the child was crawling near those electrical outlets, that was a big no-no. Hey, this has to be dealt with. They're going to get a spanking. They're going to get their hand slapped. You say, well, they didn't know that what's going to happen. You shouldn't spank them. No, I'm spanking them because they went towards something that and we have to teach them is a big no-no. And so we have to uh, uh, discipline them. There has to be consequences to that. Then there were other times where uh, things weren't so, you know, extreme. You know, like, you know, playing with outlet, big deal. Running in the street, getting hit by a car, that's a big deal. we got to have some extreme restrictions. There were other things that weren't quite as extreme. We would, there would be consequences to them, or there were certainly restrictions on them. Uh, but maybe they were things that we'd be a little flexible on because we know kids don't understand this. Or maybe uh, use it as a learning, learning tool, you know. Uh, let's talk about how, uh, you know, it's always graded, I know, but. Talk about Braden, uh, not allowed to play with fire. Now, don't you think that's a good idea? Kids shouldn't be allowed to play with fire. But, you know, occasionally a candle will be burning or there's matches or something like that, and he wanted to play with fire. And we use that as a teaching tool. Now, I know that if he grabs that candle, we're going to watch him make sure he doesn't burn the house down, but I know if he grabs that candle, uh, it's going to burn him. But you know what? Before he gets to that point, He's probably going to take his hand out and cry before it's actually like blistering and like third degree. We're there to stop him from, from burning himself too bad. But, uh, but you know, what we did, it, it, we found out he was trying to play with fire. We're like, hey, we're going to teach him. Fire's hot. We don't play with that. And so as he's getting close, we're like, no, nah, don't do it. Don't do it. That's hot. That's hot. And eventually he would get too close and he would touch it and he would start crying, you know. And so he was thinking, okay, well, now he's going to learn his lesson. We tried that. Uh, you've probably heard the story where we tried that with coffee beans. He kept wanting a coffee bean. I'm like, no, you're, you don't like that. It's not chocolate. Coffee beans are, are gross. You're not going to like it. And so finally, we just let him go ahead and eat it. So he'll learn his lesson. And he liked it, and he wanted more. And uh, and he was bouncing off walls, and I got in trouble for that. But, <laughs> but So these are kids. We're talking about parents enforcing laws upon their kids. The parents aren't perfect, right? We, our laws aren't perfect. Sometimes we don't enforce them perfectly. 
Uh, we have, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, we have trouble enforcing, I mean, uh, following some of those laws ourselves. But we're talking about a perfect God with a perfect love who wants to enforce laws. And so we see all throughout the Bible some boundaries, some restrictions and all that based on the fact that he loves us and that he loves us. Some of those restrictions are going to be, he's going to be super harsh on us. Some of those restrictions, he's going to be a little bit more flexible, kind of a learning curve and all that. And two examples right here in our text in Genesis chapter 2 is are these trees, okay? Um, you see this uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, verse 9, we see that there was also another tree, the tree of life. It says in verse 9, And out of the ground made the Lord grow, uh, God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? And we understand the story of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the fall. That was the forbidden fruit. And what have you? Look at verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I don't know to what extent they had rights to the tree of life. It sounds like that was one that they could freely have eaten of. Uh, from and maybe they did I don't completely understand some people say no I don't think they had actually eaten of that tree yet I don't know I don't understand how things were before the fall uh, but I know that obviously they ended up eating from that tree therefore there were consequences there were punishments uh, on that so then after that God decides I'm going to restrict the tree of life okay so look down at chapter 3 verse 22 and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, uh, uh, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he had taken. So he drove out the man uh, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims with a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, somebody can look at that and say, well, that just doesn't seem, that seems selfish. God wanted all the, he wanted the tree of life to himself. He wanted the knowledge of good and evil to himself. And, uh, and he just didn't want them to progress and everything. And that's kind of like the lie that Satan told them, really. You, you know, he just knows, God just knows that the day you eat of it, you'll be like gods and you'll know uh, good and evil and all that. And isn't that interesting? Satan was appealing to the flesh. Because naturally what we think is, hey, people put rules and regulations on us, they're just holding us back. They must not love us. They must not care about us, right? That's what we often think. But the fact is, well, rules and regulations aren't put there because they don't love us. They should be there, at least because they love us. And sometimes people look at the commandments of God and they think, you know, hey, there's just God just randomly thought of these things. Let's see, huh? I'll throw this command out there. You know, they're not allowed to do that, and let's see what else. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put that there. They're not allowed to do that. We'll just see if they can obey us, uh, if they can obey and not do that, and, and God, God would do it. But that's not how it works at all. And so I want to talk about the commandments, the boundaries, and the rules that, Jesus, that, that God gave us, and he gave us those uh, with, with good intentions. And so he said about the tree of life, he said, no, there's no way I'm going to let you eat of that. And you know why? Oh, he doesn't want us to live forever. Well, guess what? God provided eternal life for us to live forever. He does want us to live forever. He doesn't want us to live forever in a sin-cursed world. And guess what? You don't want to live forever in a sin-cursed world. Amen. You don't want to live forever in an imperfect body. And so God knows what's best. And so he said, no, 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 I'm going to put a chair of them with flaming sword going every which way in front of the tree because there's no way I'm going to let you touch that tree. Okay, and so he was doing it for our own good. Of course, God knew, uh, certainly, about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, that, that man would fall. I think it was kind of a plan. It was something that he understood from the very beginning. And interesting, if you think about that, I believe it was a real tree. Okay, I believe there's a real tree, real fruit on that. I believe the tree of life is a real tree. It exists in heaven right now. We read about it in Revelation uh, 22. But I think that... Uh, also, it is a little bit symbolic if you think about it. it sounds, kind of sounds like a metaphor, tree of knowledge of good and evil. And really, I think in a way that it is kind of a, uh, 
it is kind of a symbolism of every all the restrictions and all the laws that we have on this on this world. Like we don't understand the law sometimes, and we want to do that thing that we're not allowed to do. And what what is our tendency? Our our, our nature is to say, well, why can't I do that thing? You know, why is it they they told me I can't do that? Why? Why can't I do that? How close can I get to that without breaking that rule? You know. Can I just push it a little bit farther, push it a little bit farther? You know, kids would do that. Uh, I, 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 I read a meme here recently. A, a parent shared something, and they were talking about, you know, how their kid doesn't ever obey until they, like, reach this, this level of hollering where they just look like a mad person and all, everything. And I thought, well, you know, I, I, I guess that's kind of funny, but you know what? That's a real problem. You've trained your kids not to obey until you scream at them. They're kids. Kids are going to push the boundaries. And so if you say, hey, no, no, let's use our quiet voice. You know, let's not scream or whatever. They're going to see, well, let's see how serious they are about telling me I can't do that. What happens if I do that? And, you know, how far can I push that? These are natural tendencies. And so kids do that. But guess what? Adults do the same thing. How far can I push that? Can I get a little, can I get away with a little bit more, a little bit more? Am I really going to get punished? How bad is that punishment going to be? And uh, we tend to do that, and so it seems very symbolic. We definitely can get a great picture uh, from this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that just kind of, of course, sets in motion uh, all the things that, uh, that happen from then on out in the law, living under, under the commandments of God. And so let me just uh, consider, let's consider some points here about God's commandments. First of all, God's commandments, and when I say commandments, uh, I'm talking about this whole idea of restrictions, rules, you know, as a way of governing and making us, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving us a, a standard by which to live and, and regulations, how far we can go and certain things. That's what God's commands are all about. But look at that. First of all, is uh, I want to make this point here. God's commandments are perfect. Now, that's, easy to, that's easy to say. Well, of course, God's commandments are perfect. Everything he does is perfect. But when you're forced to follow one of God's commands, or you read it in the Bible, and you don't like what it says, all of a sudden, it's a little bit harder to recognize that these are perfect. But they are. God's commandments are perfect. Uh, Psalm 19, 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You can rest assured that everything God puts in his word is perfect. Every law that he gives is a perfect law. We might not understand it. Maybe there were some uh, things... Uh, certain parts of the Bible, maybe there were some cultural issues that we don't understand now, or, or whatever, but it was always a perfect law, and, it, and God's always perfect, and he changes not, uh, so, so we can understand that he is perfect, and if you really analyze the, the, the laws that he gave in the Bible, and I'm talking about main, the main commandments that we read in Exodus and Deuteronomy, but really there were laws all the way, I think he gave Adam laws, uh, you know, we basically, we really start seeing the laws at Noah's time because uh, uh, after Noah gets off the ark, he says, you know, hey, if man sheds blood, then, you know, then his blood needs to be shed. And we begin to see all these different different laws. But, you know, what? I think God always gave laws. And there's a lot of things that Adam was doing and his, his uh, children were doing before Noah ever came about. And this is uh, another one of those reasons I'm, I don't believe in the dispensational uh, theory that there's like there, there's this time of the law and then there's this time of the law. You know, God might have revealed certain things in different ways, but He's always had laws. You can find a lot of laws uh, that were that, that we find in the law of Moses, but you're like, you know, but yeah, really, but they were still following that. We recently preached on tithing, and there were laws about giving that were going on before the law of Moses. Uh, the laws about killing. Uh, that were before the law of Moses. I mean, should we do we really need a special command from God that says, hey, you know what, you shouldn't kill anybody, <laughs> right? But all these laws, really, they, they make sense when you start studying them out. They make a lot of sense. And any government that's going to judge the people would do well to look at the Bible and say, hey, these are God's laws, and the law of the Lord is perfect, and we need to go according to what God's plan is uh, because he has it right. On Wednesday nights in Iola, I've been preaching a, a series on God's commandments. And my plan is, the way I see it in my head, it's kind of like a, a dividing up in, in fol folders. You know what I mean? Like a, 
I'm thinking in folders in terms of a computer. So in a computer, you put stuff into, into folders, okay? So let's say you have this folder that's the law, the commandments of God, all right? And then inside that folder, you've got two more folders, the laws that deal with our relationship to God and the laws that deal with our relationship to man. And then under the, those two folders, you've got other folders, and it's all those different laws and the ten, that are the Ten Commandments, you know, is where we get the breakdown of those, those commandments. And then under each one of those, you know, there's all the commandments we get in Exodus and Deuteronomy that we see. And we'll start looking through all of those different things. And, you know, every time I go to God's Word and begin studying the laws, I'm just amazed at how much sense they actually make. And that might sound funny because you're like, well, yes, God's Word is perfect. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of times we balk at some of the things that are in the Bible and maybe even get a little on edge. And if atheists or somebody is mocking God's Word, we'll throw some of those laws at and say, oh, yeah, well, Oh, you know, what about this verse in the Bible when God said this? Does that make any sense? Do you really want to worship a God who had this kind of crazy law? But, you know, when you start studying out, you start finding out, hey, they actually make a lot of sense. Uh, it just matters uh, how you, how you uh, lay it out. But ultimately, even if we don't understand the law, if God put it in there, it's perfect. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's there for a reason, and it's good. Isn't it weird? Okay. If anybody, if any government comes up with a system of, of laws, and uh, and I've often used this uh, this analogy when I'm talking about God's laws, like let's say we were we just developed we just bought this this island and we said you know what we're separating from the United States we're going to go form our own country. That might sound good, but <laughs> that'd be kind of scary, all right? We're going to form our own country, our own nation. Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to have a set of laws. And you start deciding, well, how are we going to govern this? How are we going to how, how are we going to operate? Well, I'm telling you this: the perfect way to operate that nation would be the commands of God. In any gov form of government, by the way, a lot of our laws in the United States are very similar. You know, they they could line up with some of the laws of God. But they say, well, there's a lot of laws that we have in our land that are totally contrary to God's word. Well, yeah, let me tell you why you would do that. Why you would govern a nation and you would decide, you know what, we're, we're going to leave these commandments out. I know God says that's wrong, but hey, we gotta, we got to put God aside and, and we got to be, uh, you know, uh, inclusive to all different religions or whatever. So the only reason you would leave out one of those commandments is because you don't love the law of God. You don't love God's law. Why don't people love God's law? Because they want to do those things that God forbids. <laughs> and so you say, well, yeah, well, the Bible says uh, that if someone commits adultery, they need to be put to death. If somebody commits homosexuality, they need to be put to death. And our government today says, no, that's a terrible law. That's a terrible law. We wouldn't want to do that. Well, why would they put those kinds of laws? Well, they, well, they want to be able to do all kinds of wickedness. And, uh, and they don't want to start going down that road and putting, and putting laws on that. And so as a result, you look at all the damage that happens in our country because people are breaking these laws. They say, why don't they learn that this is bad? We should restrict that. You should punish this. And the reason why is because, look, they want to be able to do those things too. You know, they want to be able to do all uh, the wickedness. Now, uh, uh, in the Bible, we see, look at, uh, uh, no, that's under the next point. So here, here, here's what I was thinking about this, though. So, okay, we can, we can talk about that. We can say, well, yeah, the government, you know, they... Uh, they're messed up and they make their own rules and they don't go by uh, the laws of, of God. But you know what? There are other forms of government. How about the government of a church, for instance? Now, you know there's a lot of people out there, even good Christians, uh, Baptist churches even, who decide that there are some laws in the Bible that they want to overlook. Well, I know the Bible says that, but maybe it's not interpreted, uh, interpreted right or something like that or or, you know, I just don't think that was that's for us. I think that was a different time. And they start allowing some of these things to happen. You know, an example is we talk about some kind of women, women pastors. Uh, you know, I sat down with a tax guy today, and he is talking about how we specialize in, uh, in the ministers and, and everything. I'm telling you, it was a bad deal. I'm going to end up paying this year probably. <laughs> What's that kind of new tax guy? Uh, anyway, so he's saying, I special, we specialize in ministers. And he starts talking about, all these ministers and these boards and all this kind of stuff. And he said, well, actually, a lot of churches are, 
starting to go with women pastors and stuff like that. And I was like, uh, you know, this is, this is not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that's okay, right? But why would a church decide that? Well, because they want women pastors. They want to go against that. The women say, hey, that's not fair. We want to have our rights. We want to do that. And so they go against that. Well, here's the problem is they're going against the word of God. And uh, the word of God uh, is perfect. The laws of the Lord are perfect. And sometimes even in our homes, you know, we will allow certain things and we'll, we'll say, well, you know, I know at church you can't do that. Yeah, I know, uh, uh, you know, God's word says this or whatever, but we allow a little leeway. And sometimes we will allow those things because we want them. And we're, we're, we can become adults and we can enforce laws upon our kids. But guess what? Even as adults, we still have a tendency to want to do wrong. You ever notice that? And so sometimes we're bad at even making rules for our kids because, like, we don't even follow those rules. <laughs> and the thing about how our society is, here's the thing that blows my mind. We put restrictions on kids, right? Okay, I'm growing up, for instance, uh, you know, you might see your parents drinking alcohol. Now, nobody in this room, hopefully their parents, kids would never see that. But, you know, in the world, this happens a lot. And I remember a time growing up where it was like that. See your parents drinking alcohol. And you're like, you know what? I want to drink alcohol. And they're like, no, no, no. You're not allowed to drink alcohol. <laughs> right? That's an adult beverage. Right? Does that make any sense? You're putting a rule on a kid and you're saying, no, you can't do that. But they want to do it. And so it's like, well, when you get my age, then you can do it. <laughs> and I, I was contemplating that one, st- one time and thinking about all the times that they say adult. You know, oh, that's an adult video. Well, adults shouldn't be watching that either. You should be teaching kids that it's wrong. And by the time they get older, they should be like, man, I don't want anything to do with that kind of stuff. Right? It's not adult. But in our nature, we don't even know how to give rules because we are wicked ourselves, right? So God's laws are the best thing we can go off of. Amen. Even if I don't feel right to you, uh, you have a hard time with it or whatever, just say, you know what? The laws of the Lord are perfect. Uh, so God's commandments are perfect. Number two, God's commandments are for our good. And this is hard to acknowledge. Again, it seems almost sometimes like you, you would just think like God just started creating this random, these random rules. So yeah, I'm going to make you follow this rule. I'm going to make you follow that rule. But no, all the rules have a purpose and they have a reason and they're for our good. That's the only reason he even gave those. So let's look at a few verses. First John 5. First John 5. Look at verse 3. It says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Now, you might feel like, oh, no, it's so hard to keep the commandments. It's so hard. I'm not allowed to do this. I'm not allowed to do that. No, but the point is that they're good for you. If you, if you will obey the commandments of, of God, it's actually going to help your life be better. If you disobey the commandments of God, you're going to have all kinds of problems in your life. Because the commandments of God weren't meant to be a big burden on you. They're actually supposed to help you. The laws of God, uh, the commandments of God are for our good. Look at uh, Psalm 119. And of course you are probably familiar with the fact that Psalm 119, all the verses... Uh, except one in in that chapter are uh, they they in there in that each verse it says something about God's word and a commandment or precept or or something like that. So this is a great passage of scripture if you're looking at uh, uh, you know verses about the Bible, about the, God's word. So Psalm 119, look at verse 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. If you're a servant of God, if you love God and you realize, hey, I might not understand it, but God's words are right, then actually the servant says, I love God's laws. Now, can you imagine your kid loving you so much that they're just like, man, I love the laws that my parents give me. (laughs) I love the commandments and the rules in this house. I love them. Right? But this is true. If we love God and we realize, hey, his words are perfect and they're for our good, 
as his servants, we say, you know what? The law of the Lord are perfect. Uh, you know, I love them. I love them. Look at verse uh, 165, same chapter. This is a great verse to memorize. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. Look, when you tell somebody a law from the Bible and they get all bent out of shape, I just don't think that's right. I just don't think you should tell people not to do that or that they ought to do that or whatever. And you're like, hey, I, or they're like, hey, don't judge me. And you're like, I just read the Bible to you. Like, I'm not trying to, ju- I didn't make that commandment up. I'm just showing you from God's word, you know, what he said. And, and people are bent out of shape. Well, guess what? Probably because they don't love the law of the Lord. Probably because they have, they love themselves and they want to be able to do these things and they're like, it's just not right to have these kind of restrictions on me or whatever. But the law of the Lord is actually for our good. Did I ever turn this on? Am I on? Do I need to turn it on now? Okay. Sorry about that. Messed it up. Okay, so uh, people who are grieved and offended by God's words, they just they not they don't love him enough. And look, let's be honest, none of us love him perfectly. So all of us fall into that sometime where it's hard for us to get on board with God's laws. And maybe we do get offended by certain things. And we don't like whenever somebody calls out a sin in our life or something like that. But in those moments, we're not loving God like we ought to. Because if we love God and we loved his word, nothing would offend us. You know, nothing is going to uh, 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 be problematic. Hey, I want to know more of his law. Teach me more. What else does the Bible say? I love it when people are like that. When you get a new Christian... Or somebody who maybe they've been, they haven't been serving the Lord for a long time, and they come back around, and they're just on fire, and they got this zeal, and they're just like, "Hey, tell me more." You know, I remember one time I was uh, going to preach on uh, the attire of a woman, and uh, and the uh, the subject of women wearing pants was going to come up, and I remember thinking, "Hey, there's a lot of women in our church who, you know, for many many years have done that, don't have a problem with it, and I'm probably going to ruffle some feathers. I'm probably going to make some people upset." And a lady had just started coming to our church. Lord willing, she's going to join next week, actually, Miss Marty. And uh, and she just started coming to our church, and she was trying to find uh, find out what we believe. She was wanting to to learn and to grow. And she and she messaged me and said, "Hey, are women? Is it a sin for women for women to wear pants?" And she was and she because she saw what I was going to be preaching the next week, and she and I was thinking, "Oh man, I'm, I'm fixing to lose her. <laughs> she's not going to come back." And I said. Well, here's what the Bible says, and, and here's what that. And, and if you come to the service, uh, you know you'll understand more. I'm going to explain it, and I'm going to be, you know, very careful how I say it, all this stuff. And basically, by the end of the conversation, she was like, "Don't worry about offending me." She said, "I want to know what the Bible says." Amen. And I was like, "Well, praise the Lord." <laughs> you know, we need more people like that. And uh, and the same thing, uh, I've talked about many times, Brother Jeff, when he first started coming, he was doing soul winning and all that kind of stuff. And he, every time we'd go out, he'd be asking me, you know, what's the Bible say about this? Should I should I wear this? You know, is it wrong for me to have an earring? Is it? And he's just always asking me, and why? He wasn't, like, expecting that I'm going to offend him. Oh, I can't believe he believes those things and then never come to our church anymore. He's just like, show me in the Bible where it says that. I want to learn. I want to grow. Every time I'd show him something, he'd be like, well, i got to stop doing that. And he would change his life. Why? Because he loves the law of the Lord. And he realizes that these laws are for his own good. And he wants to grow and he wants to thrive. And so he says, I'm going to obey the laws of God. In order to obey them, I need to know what they are. So teach me. This is the way a child of God uh, ought to be. The commandments are for our good. So what are the commandments? Go to Exodus 20 real quick. Quickly. Exodus 20. And as I said, as you start studying these things, you realize how much uh, common sense they actually make. Sometimes, like I said, people think of like the Ten Commandments, just these ten rules that God just, you know, randomly picked and said, yeah, I'm going to make sure everybody follows these rules. But really, when you start breaking these down, they make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, the first uh, few commandments, the first five commandments have to do with... uh, uh, our commandments, um, I mean, our relationship with God and how we serve Him and not breaking these. And so I told you about the study that I've been doing in Iola on Wednesday nights. And, and if you haven't listened to any of those, I'm not saying it's just like some dynamic, wonderful thing to listen to. But I think you can learn some uh, some things from that if you have an opportunity to look at uh, to look at those. If you need a link or something like that, I'll give it to you. 
But uh, I'll study in this, and we're continuing in this series. We'll start with verse 13. Now, verse 13, again, this is going to start dealing with our relationship with man. All right, so let's say you, you ha you're, having, you're, you're trying to come up with some laws for this country, uh, or this nation that you're going to start. All right. Now, what would you say would be like the most, like the worst thing that somebody could do? Worst thing, I mean, I think everybody in this world understands that the worst thing you can do to somebody is in their life, right? The value of the life uh, of a life is, is super important. Worst thing you do is take their life. Then they don't exist anymore, right? So worst thing, you could say, like, no, there's worse things you can do with me than kill, than, than kill me. But as far as uh, uh, pronouncing judgment on somebody uh, from a nation standpoint, how to govern a nation, the worst offense is probably going to be, uh, be murder. Now, if, if you don't think that's naturally understood within people, just ask somebody, you know, if they've ever committed a sin, and it's like, well, I've never killed anybody. <laughs> like, that's just like the ultimate thing they can think of is killing somebody. Now, uh, it's funny, I don't want to, I don't want to get in and preach everything that I've been preaching on Wednesday night, so we'll be here all night for one thing. Uh, but this is interesting. All the other modern versions, I found out, pretty much all the modern versions changed, thou shalt not kill to thou shalt not murder. And uh, you say, well, isn't that what it means? I mean, because obviously some killing is not wrong. It's specifically talking about murder, right? Well, there's a lot of other types of killing that aren't wrong, that aren't murder as well. And so if, you, if you're looking towards to see, hey, what, what does God say about killing? You know, what about accidental, accidentally killing somebody? What about, uh, uh, you know, killing somebody's animal? Or what about, you know, somebody is killed because of my negligence or, or all these kinds of things. And, uh, and actually, as you continue to read on, there's all these different judgments based on, hey, if this person dies and then they go before the judges and the judges have to reason these things out. Hey, the, the thing was killing is forbidden, all right? And kill, but there are some ways about killing that, hey, that actually wasn't wrong, that was actually okay. All right, now obviously murder uh, murder is the ultimate, you know, that's the wrong motive and everything. This is why you can look at Jesus when he quotes this verse, he says, commit no murders. And so, yeah, there's, it's, a, it's synonymous there. But I do think like the King James is more correct by saying killing in this instance than, uh, than those who change it to murder. And, uh, and so Jesus then is not wrong by saying not, not to commit murders because that's definitely included in this verse. But in that context, going past what all the other laws are going to deal with is breaking down the intricacies of that. So that you got to understand the Ten Commandments, these are like ten general laws. It's not like, and then there's these other 600 laws in addition to the Ten Commandments. No, actually, the Ten Commandments are like the main laws. And then if you take files inside each of those files, remember I was talking about that, you know, there's going to be all these other ways to break them down. This is the legal system that he was setting up, and probably a lot of intricacies that we don't, we're not actually privy, privy to, okay? But look at verse, uh, what did I say, 13? And I began to realize this, like, thou shalt not kill. Well, that makes sense. That's going to be way at the top of the list. Somebody be like, well, why is thou shalt not commit adultery next? I mean, let's say these are going in order of, like, the worst sins to the, to the lowest you know, sins. And yes, by the way, God does put different judgments upon different sins. Not all sins are equal as far as the, as far as the punishment that goes with them. Just like not all uh, sins that our kids commit are equally punishable you know, and, and, or, or restricted. But it says, thou shalt not kill. And then it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then the next one is, thou shalt not steal. Now you say, well, what about stealing? Okay, stealing, there's no death penalty involved in stealing. Right? Stealing, if you steal something, uh, you know, you just got to pay it back sevenfold or, or whatever. And that's true, but you know what? There are some types of stealing where death might be involved. Well, for one thing, if you break into somebody's house and they kill you, you're, they're justified in killing you. Because that person didn't know what you were going to do. You might have been threatening their life. Maybe you were going to end up killing them. So, uh, so they were justified in killing you. But look at, thou shalt not commit adultery, sandwiched right in between those, and... That, and committing adultery was something that was punishable by death. Well, I find it really interesting because what is like the worst thing that somebody could do? Oh, here's another stealing, uh, another act of stealing that is punishable by death. Man stealing. We would call it kidnapping, okay? If you steal some a person, man, you're, you're going to die, okay? 
Now commit adultery. Well, what's the greatest thing that you could steal from me? You could take my house, you could take my car, you could, and, and you take anything, and that's like, well, I still got my family, right? But if you steal somebody from my family, right, that's that's you know, that's death penalty, okay? Now let's say you steal my wife. You see what I'm saying? You steal her away and her affections and all that, or you have a relationship with her that only I'm supposed to have with her. You stole something from me, and so there's a lot we can get into that. And this isn't the this isn't the um, the, the right series. That's Wednesday nights. Okay, a lot to get into that. But when you start breaking these down, and then you follow it up with Exodus 21, Exodus 22, you go to Deuteronomy where he's telling the law a second time, and you get to Deuteronomy 22, and it breaks down all these intricacies about uh, about adultery and rape and fornication and and murder and accidental murder and all these kinds of things. The Ten Commandments were just like a very broad brush, you know, memorize these Ten Commandments, fine, but then there's more detailed uh, judgments that go with breaking those, those laws, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we understand Matthew 22, look there real fast, Matthew 22, this isn't new, I realize I've, I've, I've shared this before, but it's good for us to just remember this. Matthew 22, and this is leading to my third point as well. Jesus breaks those Ten Commandments down into two commandments, which I've already alluded to. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, that's somebody who studied the law, asked him a question, tempting him, and, said, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And they said, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Well, well, how, how is loving my neighbor like unto loving God? Well, if you love God, you're going to do follow his commandments. And what is well, all of his commandments have to do with it? Loving people as ourselves, you know, not wanting to steal from them, not wanting to uh, kill them, not wanting to commit adultery with somebody's wife, not to do all these kinds of things because based in love. So this uh, brings me to my last point. So let's re recap. Number one, God's commandments are perfect. Number two, God's commandments are for our good. Number three, when we walk in the spirit, the commandments really don't apply. Now, I didn't say if you're a Christian, you can just break all the rules. It doesn't matter. No, I said when you walk in the Spirit, the commandments don't apply. Because when you walk in the Spirit, guess what? You're going to be keeping the commandments naturally. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 22. Galatians 5, 22. He just got done talking about the, uh, the works of the flesh. Let's go ahead and go through those. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. All those kind of go together in a way. Idolatry, witchcraft, those kind of go together. And then this group go together. Hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There is no law. Well, let, me, let me just give you this law about how much you can love somebody. <laughs> let me give you this law about how long you can tolerate somebody's behavior. How long, how many times you have to forgive somebody. Let's give this law about how meek you're allowed to be. Uh, you know, no, there's no laws about that. Uh, and, and you know what? If you're following those laws, you are not going to be breaking those other laws uh, that, God, that God gives us. The law, okay, here's another thing people say. I already hit on dispensationalism once, okay? Let me hit on the king. Dispensationalism says, right? The Old Testament, we're under the law. 
And then Jesus dies on the cross, and thus he ends the law, and now we're under grace. You ever heard that kind of, a, that kind of an idea? Yeah. Actually, Jesus dying on the cross did not end the law. Amen. <laughs> the law still goes on, and everybody knows that. Okay, he ended the law, so now just go about killing everybody and committing adultery and all. No, 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 some of the law. Well, the Ten Commandments, those still apply, right? No, Jesus dying on the cross did not end the law. Now, he brought something that did end the law, so let's read these. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I gotta read this one first and then we'll get to the point that I'm trying to make. Romans chapter 10. So here's what he says. Romans chapter 10, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I think about the time that he was living in, you think about the fact that he was an Israelite. He had a huge burden for his people, and he says, My desire is that they shall they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, in going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay, so that's the verse where people say, see, Christ, the end of the law. He dies on the cross. He begins the end, the, the law, the, the age of grace, and now we're no under, not under the law. But that's not what he's saying. Go to First Timothy chapter one. See the 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 fact is when you are saved, when you're a child of God and you're in love with the Holy Spirit, you now have within you the one thing that ends the law okay through jesus christ yes and so it was you know by what he did uh that, that the law can be ended but only if like we saw in galatians chapter 5 if you walk in the spirit okay so first timothy 1 5 says this now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith undefiled now, if you have faith in the Lord, you love the Lord, you love the law of the Lord, right? We already talked about it. You love the Lord, uh, the law of the Lord, and nothing shall offend you, and, and you're and trying to walk in the Spirit, you're trying to obey, uh, follow God, and, and obey what He's told you to do. You know what you're going to do is you're going to love Him, you're going to love your neighbors, and all of a sudden, you know what? There are no commandments. You don't have to worry. You live your life about, oh, no. If you really love God, you're going to keep all the commandments. And so you live this whole life of just like trying to restrict yourself and not do this and create all these huge judgments on anybody that does this or whatever that. Like, look, their laws are good. The laws of the Lord are perfect. And they must be enforced. For people who, who don't love the Lord and live wickedly, they need to be enforced. By us who get in the flesh and don't always walk in the spirit from time to time to time, we get in the flesh and we do this. We need to know that those laws are there. We need people to hold us accountable. We need there to be repercussions whenever we fall into sin. All right? The, the government, our government doesn't do it, so some of these laws have to be enforced inside the church. Cause somebody to get uh, kicked out of the church, or, or maybe somebody will come, and they're going to uh, 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 push you around a little bit and get in your face and say, why are you doing this? Or, or maybe uh, someone stole from somebody, whatever you have to go to, uh, uh, the church and talk about how wicked that is and get that matter settled between each other. You know, the Bible talks a lot about judgment within the church and all that kind of stuff. Well, we need to go back to the law because we don't live perfectly in our love for the Lord. We don't walk perfectly in the spirit, loving each other and having peace and long suffering, gentleness and meekness and all these kinds of things. And so we need the law. But the idea is that if you are actually loving the Lord and, the, and walking in the spirit and loving one, uh, other people, then you don't live this life of feeling like, oh man, the restrictions, oh the boundaries, oh I'm so tired of all the rules and all that kind of stuff. You don't think of the laws of God as being boundaries and rules because you're walking in the Spirit, and there is no commandments. There is no you're just you're just trying to please God, and so it's kind of like this, not perfectly because like I said, we're all human, we all make mistakes, but it's kind of like this. My children, as long as they're in my house, they've got to live by my rules. 
you know, now obviously I'm going to try to enforce godly rules, but that's the, the, for the sake of the illustration, they've got to obey all my rules, whatever those rules are, because I put those rules in place to help them learn this is the kind of human being I want you to be. This is the kind of, these are the kind of decisions I want you to make. I want you to live right. I want you to do this. I want you to choose to do these things. I want you to not act that way in this situation. I want you to, oh, that's the reason for all the rules in my, it should be anyway, all the rules in my house that I want my kids to follow. But when my kids grow up, get married, move out, have their own house, they're no longer under my rules because they should have learned what my rules are and they should be living those out. Uh, I don't have to go check up on their house every once in a while and say, hey, let's see what you're watching. Hey, see what kind of things you're talking about. Let's see if you're doing this or you're doing that. That's that, that's They're now walking in my laws, okay? Now, look, we live, like I said, we're imperfect. We're never going to walk by all of God's laws perfectly. That's why we constantly have to be reminded of the law and the laws have to be enforced whenever we break them. But theoretically, yeah, when you're walking in love, and you're loving God's law, and you love the Lord, and because you love the Lord, you love people because he loves people, and he's told you to love people, and you have that love, and you, you do all these things. It's like, okay, you're not under any laws. You're not under any boundaries or whatever. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so we walk in the, in the Lord and, uh, and follow his, his, his laws. His laws are perfect. And since we don't always love him like we should, and walk in the spirit as we should. We need those laws. We need those boundaries. And so because of that, it is important that we have boundaries in our life and we learn, hey, these are the things I'm going to, these are the restrictions I'm going to live by according to God's word. And, uh, and I'm not going to go to these places. I'm not going to do these things. I'm not going to wear this. Say, so, oh, we're in Christ. We have liberty. Yeah, but we're not always walking in the spirit. <laughs> and so therefore, we've got to have these boundaries. Where do we get the boundaries? God's word, because God's word is perfect. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Certainly do love your word, and, uh, and I pray that you will help us to never lose sight of the fact that they're good for us, and they're perfect, and if we would just love you like we ought to, and love other people like we ought to, then we would never buck against your, your word, and we would never uh, 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 be offended and be aggravated and you know, feel overly restricted by the laws and the ways that we're told to live. I pray, Lord, that you just help us to uh, love you more and to empty out the things in our life that would hinder us from loving you more. And I pray that you would just uh, um, uh, help us to learn and grow in your word. We just now pray. Amen. 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 All right.